Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Episode 33, special guest, Eric Bluestein, author of The Ways Children Learn Music. All right, so we're here with, with uh, Eric Bluestein. Eric, thanks for coming. It is a pleasure to join you, gentlemen. Thank you for inviting me. Eric, you and I go back to Temple University. I remember you yes, mostly we became good friends in um, when we were both doing our doctoral program in the 90s. Um, but we had met uh, soon after Daryl Walters had started there um, in the late 80s. And he was our advisor. Right. And thank goodness for that, because I learned how to think, because I learned how to write. And writing helped my thinking, and thinking helped my writing. What a uh, brilliant teacher he was. What a hard ass. <laughs> but in a good way. In the and, best and we're, possible And we're way. grateful. We're grateful for that. We, we needed that little kick. So, you, know, <laughs> you, you think you've written the, the, the paragraph of the century, and then you, you, bring, you show it to him, and he's, he's got that red pencil out already doing scribbles and re reorganizing sentences. and. You know, it's, it's very good. I was in chapter five of my dissertation, and I went through, and we were going over my, the comments he sent me, and uh, I got to a page that didn't have anything on it. And I, I said, did you, did you miss this? He says, no, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing I had to say. And I, I just <laughs> about fainted. The, the greatest praise is nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Zen. That's so funny. So it's cool you guys mentioned that because I uh, uh, last year I was listening to Anders Ericsson talk about his experience with his PhD advisor and this deliberate practice with learning how to write for academic audience and and just how much revision the guy would get him to do. You know, sometimes twenty plus revisions on a paper. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, you didn't turn anything in unless you were on about your fifth draft. I didn't dare. Yeah. Getting back to our dissertation days. Wow, that's a, not, 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 not very many pleasant memories. So the, the few pleasant memories stand out. I, I like to say to people who are, you know, I, I turn into the wise old sage when someone is pursuing an advanced degree, and I say to them, look, if you don't have, if you're pursuing a doctorate and you don't already have a thick skin, you're in trouble. You, you better cultivate that thick skin as soon as you can, because you're yeah. going to face a lot of opposition, especially if you're doing something meaningful. Um, yeah. Because if it's meaningful, yeah. it's, it's going to be at least somewhat original. And if it's somewhat original, it's going to get people's backs up to a certain extent. Yeah, so. yeah I, I totally agree. Or the best thing I could say even better is you come in hungry and you just never lose the taste for the buffet that's in front of you and and drive drive that food truck until your heart's content until enough people uh, get some kind of commonality around the new distinctions we're bringing to the party or the new information the new um, way of thinking about some things so yeah, uh, I was I was privileged to have all the company we did back in the day. So many great people, yeah, uh, and and many of them are on a list to eventually be guests. <laughs> or some Very of them. Very nice. Good. Uh, so on the on the topic of doctorate studies, um, what was your uh, thesis on your PhD thesis on? I was writing about um, tonal music literacy and how to how to begin. Uh, once students have passed through the preliminary steps of oral, oral, verbal association, partial synthesis, with maybe occasional forays into generalization and a bit of creativity, once you're ready to start teaching uh, notation, how and where do you start? What do you do? And I, I had never bought into the notion that children have to start reading whole pattern. Um, I, I, that always seemed to me to be fishy. Um, because if you know, if you take an analogy with language, and I'm not a big believer that analogies should necessarily guide us. Analogies are, are by their nature, faulty comparisons. Um, you're always going to find a place where the analogy veers off, 
and and sort of skews into a you know you, you drive the car into the river you, if you keep driving far enough along that path. But um, in language learning, uh, study after study showed that phonics is indispensable. That is the breaking up of words. <laughs> and I figured out a way, after a long, long, long time, to break up a pattern into its component parts of pitches without degenerating into the teaching of isolated pitches that have no syntactic meaning. How do you how do you teach pitches <laughs> while maintaining <laughs> syntax? And uh, I figured you're, out you're probably how to do it. the first yes, person I've ever heard uh, go to bat for that idea, and I'm probably not as far as you are in terms of the practical application about this. But I've had a very big um, kind of bone to pick with this idea of the analogy between reading essentially sight words for music, like whole patterns, yeah. and with this idea from language that phonics. A systematic phonics outperforms um, whole language programs consistently. And even in Gordon's work, he uses this analogy, which you, you appropriately brought up. We have to be careful with analogies because, you know, we're talking about learning to read English versus learning music, which is not even right. technically a language. So there could be things that cross over. But in, we know how efficient whole language is with teaching, especially sight words. And um, this has been something that's been on my mind a lot over the past year and i had no idea where we we're going to go here so why don't you uh lead us on you know <laughs> an exciting okay. path well, I'm, I'm trying to remember because it's, it's been a good 15 years since my my uh dissertation was finished and written and all that stuff i'm mean, basically you're always going to have sight words in language they're, they're just very real but um sure. if you have an underpinning of phonics training the, the sight words are not only going to be easier to learn, they're not going to bother you as a beginning reader. You're just going to say, oh, well, that's mostly phonetic. I've got, I've got these letters and sounds, and I can piece it together, and, and I'll just move on to the next word. Um, and in you know, one study after another, one randomized controlled study after another, phonics has always come out on top in, uh, in terms of not only comprehension, but also speed of reading, which was a real surprise to a lot of people because the, the the uh, the supposition was that phonics will slow a reader down, and initially that was true. But as readers become more and more proficient, they get faster and faster. And so they not only comprehend more, but they read more fluently. Um, and, and just considering yeah. how generalizable that approach actually is, I was... Uh... I was reading something that uh, Siegfried Engelman wrote, where if you if you take a small amount of content that you would teach in terms of phonics, the amount of power in terms of how many words you could theoretically pronounce versus the same amount of uh, time spent learning sight word content. Um, and you rightly pointed out, you do have to introduce some sight words that are irregular that don't follow phonics uh, logic. Precisely. And you should but do that early. So. Yeah, yeah, but that should happen relatively early still, so students don't have a misrule that everything is phonetically pronounced. There are exceptions to um, strict phonics. But... Right, but, but even the words that aren't strict, they're mostly strict. Um, sure, sure. And, and you, you learn spelling patterns and things like that. Um, you know, there's a wonderful, there was, she, she passed away many decades ago, but there was a wonderful uh, professor of reading at Harvard uh, Professor Jean Shaw, who uh, theorized a series of stages of reading development. And they are not all that different from some of the speculations that Gordon made. Um, what happened with my study was that children did beautifully with the symbolic association level. And they did, I thought, beautifully with composite synthesis. I taught that even though I, I had my suspicions about whether or not it really belongs anywhere. Um, it turns out in my book I was wrong, I think, but we can go into that in a little bit. Uh, but uh, they really messed up at the generalization symbolic level. They, they couldn't handle it. And I went back to my notes and I thought to myself, what, what happened? Uh, because they did swimmingly at all the preliminary levels of, uh, of road learning, of discrimination learning. And, and I started to think, you know, maybe there's something about composite synthesis that even if you teach all the content, According to everything that you think of as the textbook way to do it, you teach everything by the book, there's still something missing, and that is the time to absorb teaching a paragraph of patterns. Maybe it's not about um, 
Uh, may, maybe it's not a, a cognitive issue. Maybe it's a developmental one. And I went back to Jean Shaw's stages, and one of her stages is the ability to absorb a paragraph of words and really absorb it. It's not something that you learn. It's something that you, it's a stage of development that you have to move through. And you have to move through it with entirely familiar content. She says, don't move on to unfamiliar content until kids can read a, a, a series of sentences and paragraphs with 100% familiar content. <laughs> and I thought, ding, 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 composite synthesis, folks. Maybe. I mean, we're, it's a little bit early in our discussion to get into this. I don't know if, some, if, if people are ready for this. Maybe I was wrong when I said that composite synthesis is completely unnecessary. Maybe it's just unnecessary in the stages of or in the um, levels of learning. Maybe it doesn't belong in the skill learning sequence, but maybe it belongs somewhere as one of several stages of music reading development. So my thinking is that phonics is both a level of learning and a stage of development. Composite synthesis is a stage of development only. We that, touched that's, where the, I, yeah. that's where I am with that now. Yeah, we touched on this in the conversation at the, the uh, conference last yeah, time. Yeah, that's right. And boy, I could have gotten into it for a good long while. What you're showing me and Bo is exactly what we've spoken about uh, just recently, um, but with regard to this specific skill learning, uh, you know, sequence. It's really, um, it's really, it's really great. So let's let's. let's yeah, this do, is the fun stuff. It, it is. It is because that's what our podcast is. Is just uh, we're delving into areas that we don't necessarily know and we're trying to carve new ground or open up new conversations we don't necessarily know about everything we're talking about well enough but the it opens a new territory and you're someone you and I had Dr. Gordon's class in music learning theory and music oh, yeah. aptitude and mm -hmm. and uh, measurement and evaluation yes uh, we did. so and we've I been was, yeah I'm yeah. sorry go ahead and then, and then out of that, given the need the community had to uh, make sense out of learning sequences and music and how difficult it was for so many of us, including me, uh, those first four chapters before I took music learning theory two, he just said, oh, just read the first four chapters. I was like, okay, well, I never got very far before I was lost. Um, but you decided um, that we need a, a book that waters this down a little bit. And it, watering it down isn't quite, it, just making it presentable and turning his language uh, into uh, readable English <laughs> Yeah, for and, the beginner. And, and so the ways children learn music, I wanna, I wanna ask people, even if they've read learning sequences and music kind of have a handle on it, boy, you'll get another perspective when you see it written the way Eric writes. Uh, and I uh, thank you for that okay. contribution because well, it's, thank you. it's been huge. It's been huge for the community. I hear about it all the time. And that's something that Eric always recommends uh, whenever I'm trying to get someone into uh, Gordon's ideas. I, I get, get people to, to go after your book. Uh, well, that, thank you, guys. That's, that's really wonderful to hear. That's really, really wonderful to hear. I am... Um, I mean, the way it came about, I don't know if you want me to go into the history of this a little bit. Oh, for sure. Um, well, just to wrap up, the dis there's one more dissertation story with, with Daryl. Okay, sure. Um, the, yeah. the, the way the, the um, study wound up was that uh, none of the four groups uh, outperformed any other. So it was, from a statistical standpoint, a complete washout. They all did equally well or equally poorly uh, you know, with, the, with the criterion measures, depending on how you want to interpret it. And the reading of whole patterns did not outperform uh, individual pitches within patterns. Um, and by the way, this is the thing that I'm most proud of. I'm just a little aside. I figured out how you can teach individual pitches and still make them syntactically meaningful. Instead of, because I think that was Gordon's big fear. Individual pitches have no syntactic meaning. Not necessarily, if you mm -hmm. play your cards right. And I wrote a blog post about this, and uh, it's rather a lengthy blog post. And I used my daughter as a kind of a demonstration to um, help me sing with her sight reading patterns. And I showed how it, how it's how it could be done. 
but um anyway none of the four i think that's really important though just to just to just to stay on that topic for a sec because the if you can if you can keep the syntactical meaning with the individual pitches in a tonality for example the power of generalization you could get from that versus having to read whole patterns is is exponential i mean absolutely it it really is and uh, and uh so I, I mean, I I think that's a very interesting topic. Um, I, I'd be very curious to hear more about the specifics about navigating that. Okay, yeah, it's a little <laughs> bit. It's much easier to to show uh, than it is to to talk about. Um, okay. But it's, I've written a blog post about it. Uh, I I went on a tear about a couple of years ago writing about music language analogies, and I had about five uh, blog posts in a row just going on about analogies that I thought worked and analogies that I thought, you know, were less helpful. Um, because the, the purpose of analogies is to spark our thinking. Uh, it's not so that we can say to parents, well, we have to teach this way because this is how language works. Well, the word because is a problem because you're, you, what you're doing is putting an equal sign between language and music when you do that. The analogies help our thinking. And to a certain extent, they help our explaining to other people what we do in a kind of quick and dirty way. But we always have to be wary of them, that they are analogies. And by definition, they're, they're not equal signs. Uh, they're, the analogies will break down. So some analogies are more helpful and fruitful than, than others. Um, and I started off by talking about analogies that didn't work. Um, but the, the granddaddy of all analogies for me is a linguistic one where I'm comparing individual pitches within patterns to, get this, inflectional bound morphemes in language. And once you start thinking like that, once you understand what those terms mean, and once you start thinking like that, then you can start to design a series of lessons that transform individual pitches into something that you can work with. Um, But... I, so I, I, I hope everyone will read that. I wrote a blog post about it that I'm very proud yeah, of. We'll, if you want to find out more information about it, go to the Music Language Analogies. It's there. But, yeah, we'll link it. Uh, we'll okay, link it please, in the show notes. Please so do. It's, a, every, it's a fun one. It's a fun one. It's a, it's a good one. Like, it's a little deep. I, I had it, a it couple readings on that one because I didn't yeah. know some of the vocabulary it's, it's, for sure. Exactly. You have to go back and sort of you know, progress through it slowly. And I did too. You know, it's, but it's fun. Uh, and I tried to, I tried to keep it. As, as light as you can keep a topic like that, I tried to keep it light. But none of the four groups, anyway, to get back to the thing, none of the four groups outperformed any of the others. And I went to Daryl almost in tears, and I thought, after all that hard work, uh, I, I, he said, you didn't crash and burn, trust me. This, is, you know, it, it's, this happens more often than it doesn't, that one group will not outperform another in a way that's statistically significant. That's just the nature of the beast. If you've constructed the study well, you, generally speaking, will not get statistically significant difference between and among groups. And he said, and there that, can be a lot yeah. of publishing bias in journals where, when you read a journal, you're seeing all these uh, st- statistically significant um, right. effects. But I mean, no, not many people are are publishing things that have no effect. Uh, a yeah. lot of people will shy away from publishing, so there can be huge bias in you know the effect size in, sure. in certain journals. Sure, and and um, the no effect was a big deal. The no yeah. effect, because, I mean, Daryl said to me, Eric, you, you did a, a tremendous service. You kicked the stilts out from under the extremists. Those mm-hmm. were his exact words. Yeah. You kick the stilts out from under the extremists. Whole patterns, let's not, let's not go crazy. You know, let's not assume before we have any real evidence that that's the way to go initially. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my dissertation story for what it's worth. So, Yeah. Yeah, so I I think a lot of um, a lot of people, if they go after trying to learn individual um, pitches in the way that we would aural orally learn a whole pattern, we still have this problem of context. And I think a lot of people who go after that don't establish tonality before they do that, and they might not even do something like, you know, play a melody like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in major and then point out that the individual pitch they're trying to teach is actually the pitch that's at the start of a song that they're familiar with. Like there might not be those simple associations that are made. Um, but I, I'm curious, what were the different groups in the, the study that you did? Because I think you said there were four, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Um, there, I, one group learned whole patterns exclusively for the entire trial of the study, the entire treatment period of the study. 
One group learned individual pitches within patterns, individual pitches within functional patterns in the context of a tonality, uh, exclusively. Uh, one group, uh, for the entire run of the treatment period, one group learned uh, whole patterns for half of the time and then individual pitches within patterns the rest of the time. And the other group learned individual pitches first and then whole patterns. So it was A, B, A before B, B before A. And that's, those, were, those were my groups. And how long was the treatment period? Oh, my God, now we're, we're going. It was, um, I believe it was a 30-week trial. I mean, 30. I believe it was, I, like I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure it ran for a long, long time, yeah. A lot yeah. of, um, or 30, well, 30 lessons. Uh, yes. And I oh, and, okay. and I'm not sh I can't quite re recall how many. It may have been a four four or five months trial. Okay. Yeah. Did you notice between the groups was there any preference, of, like from the student standpoint? Like, did they not enjoy doing the individual pitches, or did they more uh, more than the t the whole patterns, or was it the same to them? Like, was was any of that kind of data part of it, or 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 did you notice any of that? Um, I I did notice um, that when it came to reading patterns that they knew or that they had learned before but were reviewing, the group that um, started with individual pitches and then went to reading whole patterns did the best from my subjective standpoint. That was and I just put mm -hmm. that in as anecdotal. Um, they started with individual pitches, went to whole patterns. That group seemed to do the best, and the group. Uh, the whole pattern to individual, um, they were just, for whatever reason, the best behaved group. <laughs> uh, they they seemed to be into it more than the others. Uh, huh. But that had nothing to do with their ability, That apparently. That was just, okay, yeah, we're here. Let's, you know, let's, let's do some stuff. Um, but... Uh, so we have a need to replicate oh, now, don't we? Oh, we absolutely do, because the individual <laughs> pitches first followed by whole patterns came yeah. real close to outscoring the others it was just not not enough to they it was something yeah. was bubbling up underneath the surface but not enough for me to report anything significant and the and the groups were 20 to 25 students um, or? each one closer to 30. Uh, so how much better would that group have to have done for it to be statistically significant like what was the cutoff uh, in terms of the, I would I would have to go back. Oh, that's I've, I would have to go back about fifteen years. I, I or look at the dissertation that's somewhere in my closet. I, I would have to read through it. <laughs> but I I just remember that um, mm. uh, they they had two different tests that I constructed. One was a sight singing test, and one was a sight reading test. And the sight singing test, neither, none of the groups did particularly well on. I mean they. You know, I had written a criterion measure of you know a you know, five point rating scale, where uh, I got you know the numbers that I wanted, you know the the bell curve that I wanted, but um, none of the groups could really do particularly well. Uh, they did equally poorly or equally well, but the sight reading, uh, where I kind of replicated the um, uh, Gordon's uh, achievement test. What is it called again? His only the only achievement test he ever wrote. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, the Iowa the test, Iowa test of, music of music literacy. literacy, sure. And I replicated his uh, lessons in generalization symbolic, the tonal, where he has them read seven pitches without rhythm, uh, devoid of rhythm, and he has them do And I, I basically replicated how he constructed that. Um, and one of the groups almost outperformed the others statistically, not quite. But uh, mm. so, yeah, definitely. I would definitely replicate it. And, if I had the time, instead of teaching all the time, and, yeah. and, and undo a lot of the mistakes that I made. I've pled for money for research on, on this podcast on four or five occasions. <laughs> I just want to get to the bottom of some things, and you can't do it if you don't have the, the time. Uh, and with time, there's the money to support yourself. Um, it's, that's great to know. Um, this idea of composite synthesis not necessarily being a, a, a skill development stage is interesting. You had mentioned that at the conference. 
And I definitely wanted to hear about why you thought and the fact that it might be a stage of development yeah. is really curious to me and, and, and it, it, it tickles something uh, in, in me. I don't, I've, I've not done literacy for the last bunch of years because by the time my kids go away, I w I'd rather have them ready for more improvisatory and creative, sure. uh, um, you know, uh, underpinnings, you know, and maximize their vocabulary, oral, oral, all the way up to partial synthesis, right? But then I, I jump to generalization uh, after that and with my, uh, my harmonic learning sequence and, and the other patterns, I've, I've taught uh, children to read. I, I, I got that down. It was so easy uh, at one point that I didn't push it um, any further. They had read everything and jumped right in uh, by by first grade uh, in in unfamiliar order. So um, that's you know. So I went to to writing and they were doing writing creativity uh, and reading any patterns that they wrote and some of them even in five and seven uh, with with uh, not with elongations or but they were doing it with divisions, mm -hmm. microbeats, macrobeats uh, in in five and seven, and so that was, you know, what I call BBN, big beats are not the same size, which is a better way to say unusual meter. Or right, because un unusual is such a loaded term, it has, and we've talked about that before. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's it's passing judgment on on uh, on uh, whatever culture happens to be, you know, using that particular <laughs> meter. Yeah. It's, it's well, you're you're the unusual folk over there. You're relegated to that unusual corner of the of the world. Yeah, and uh, yes. you guys it's don't an, even it's know five eight term. is more common than four in Canada. What's that? <laughs> I said you guys don't even know five is more common than four in Canada. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> or, or certain parts of the United States, who knows? But uh, yeah. it's a, it's a loaded term, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you had mentioned something earlier. I wanted to come back to as well. This this idea that um, if we use this analogy with language, understanding musical content at a paragraph size level is best facilitated with familiar patterns first in an unfamiliar order because it's an it's a if it's a stage or however you want to say it if it's a stage or a skill or something we have to learn or go through developmentally um, it would be difficult to learn how to to extract understanding of a whole paragraph size of musical content with with unfamiliar patterns uh, that it just seems like that would be an inherently more difficult to do versus getting someone to First, do that with patterns that are familiar, and, and make the make essentially what you're trying to teach stand out more. I feel like that would it, you'd have a lot more cognitive capacity left over to actually um, extract more meaning out of a paragraph size musical statement if you were familiar with the content within it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's been my experience largely with teaching people to improvise because, and this kind of gets into your blog post that you sent us about uh, musical content. Your twelve. Kind of yeah, you know, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. My it's a recent one, yeah. Because there's there's a big one in there. The the motif structure or the phrase structure for me is such a giant part of learning to improvise that I see a lot of people leaving kind of out of their improv uh, instruction or lessons. You know, there's if you get to the point where you're being very harmonically specific and you can outline changes, a lot of people don't know how to go from that into developing coherent phrases that also outline the changes it's not just isolated ding 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 i'm singing one chord right ding 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 five chord there's not a phrase or a motif that pierces through the whole uh whatever it was sentence or or um or paragraph and i think that's really important to learn how to do and i've i've, I've talked to eric and some of the other people on the podcast that there must be exercises you can do to encourage that type of uh, processing beyond just play more uh, <laughs> right in my right. experience yeah i mean in, in my experience a lot of jazz musicians are are really good at that but i've met great classical musicians and pop musicians as well but uh um, yeah that was uh just very interesting to to kind of skim through your those 12 main areas or, or i'm not sure how you describe them domains, yeah, domains and, that, and i i said I, even in that post you know i'm, I'm starting to rethink all this stuff and i i there's, there's a lot of things are sort of cogitating right now for me. I, I, 
I do think that, I mean, I, I don't, this may be controversial among MLT folk, uh, but I ended that particular uh, blog post by saying, you know, it, it makes it makes sense, uh, Gordon's fourth stage of audiation, where we decide on the overall form of, of a piece of music and, and we, we can tell if a modulation has taken place. Um, we, we've got, you know, one, at least one domain of one piece of music, whether it's tonality or meter, uh, we have that locked up and we can have an understanding of the, you know, the formal structure of the piece um, and maybe even predict it, stage six. And stage five of audiation is basically, uh, you know, last month I heard a piece in Dorian and three weeks ago I heard a piece in the Dorian mode and here I'm hearing a new piece of music I've never heard before and it sounds just like those other two pieces so this piece must be in the Dorian mode as well. It's making that kind of comparison. But I maintain that there is something in music where domains mix and merge and not always in cooperation with each other. Uh, that sometimes different domains of music will tell us different things about the music. And it's that conflict that grabs us. And one example that I'm going to write about, I haven't had a chance to write about it this summer because I've been writing a lot of other stuff, but um, I used to teach, uh, because I could play it, as a Beethoven piano sonata movement as a way of sort of the final step in teaching rondo form. This piece is in a classic ABACA form. It's the second movement of Beethoven's uh, pathetique piano sonata, and it's a gorgeous piece. If I had my piano here instead of locked in the other room, I would turn around and play a little bit of it. You wouldn't be able to pick it up, so it's, forget it. But um, what's neat about the piece is that metrically, it modulates from duple to triple. So from a metrical standpoint, it's in AB form. And from a tonality standpoint, it modulates from uh, major to minor and back to major again. And when it modulates uh, to minor, that's the same moment that it modulates to triple. But when it modulates back to major, it stays in triple. So you're, the mind is having some kind of push and pull, and Beethoven's playing a game with us. What's really going on? What, is, what really is the formal structure of this piece? Is it the classically controlled ABACA rondo that we expect it to be from having heard so many rondos? From a tonality standpoint, do we analyze it and understand it as ABA, or do we perceive it and understand it and audiate it from a metrical standpoint of AB, which is correct? And the answer is all of them. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that push and pull of this is the right way, no, this, this is the right way that grabs us and makes us want to come back to that piece in our audiation or in our actual listening. Um, mm -hmm. It's... And I go on to say that a piece of music that doesn't do that, that, that leaves us completely fulfilled because there's no ambiguity where we, we don't have to ponder anything or question anything or question our own uh, sense and audiation of what's going on. Those are the pieces of music that don't last from generation to generation. It's, it's the ones mm -hmm. that give us something to chew on because they're in conflict with themselves. Those are the pieces mm -hmm. that we come back to. And um, because they tantalize us, and um, yeah, I, I think that's really, I think that's a really important point. Um, you know, I can think of like this example I was talking about before with improvising. If, if you look at these different domains of music that are operating simultaneously while you're hearing a piece, uh, when we're talking about improvising over chord changes, let's say a chord changes once every bar in a jazz piece. Well, if your phrase also, if your motif structure also changes once every bar. There's there's this kind of lack of um, variety between the two domains that almost can create a type of boredom yeah. because you the one like the motif structure is now perfectly tracking the harmonic changes and not that that might be bad for the whole piece but without a bit of attention on that it could be monotonous and I I think this is kind of the genius behind if you take um, a very similar thing in London Bridge Mary had a little lamb in the Hall of the Mountain King happens at a micro scale i've talked to eric about this ad nauseum but uh you know we often think of pieces being composed harmonically first but if you look at all those folk tunes they have the same motif structure and most of them have the same harmonic structure and i would argue that the harmonic structure actually 
was born out of the motif structure, not the other way around. I do not think that people are going bum, 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 and then coming up with Mary Had a Little Lamb on top of that. I think the motif structure was invented first. And if you look at the harmonic changes underneath it, it perfectly doesn't match the motif structure. <laughs> like when the motif structure repeats, the harmonic changes sometimes stay. Uh, and I, I find that that kind of interplay is exactly what you were talking about with the Beethoven piece, but at a very kind of micro scale in, in terms of just, you know, one section of a piece rather than uh, it could happen at a grander scale in terms of the form, right. a section and the B section. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's very interesting. Um, you see this too with, um, I'm a classical guitarist and some composers are very particular about when you change the timbre of the the actual picking of the guitar and where they choose to line that up you know sometimes it's very obvious like i have a new melody i'm going to play this melody in a much pointier sounding timbre and and sometimes it'll track you know the melody but sometimes it won't it'll be a little more um it'll have that conflict just like in that beethoven uh piece that you, you, you spoke about but i you know i wonder how many people are uh, explicitly learning how to manipulate that in composition because I feel like we could probably be doing a better job to in encourage that instead of just writing more pieces. Well, why don't you write a piece that purposely manipulates some two or three of these variables and see where this goes or, or using the Beethoven piece right. as a template? Right. Well, why don't you take his schematic for how he did well, that? One composer, and, one composer that I know who was very conscious of that was Leonard Bernstein, because he's the one hmm. in, in his Harvard lectures and the Norton lectures that that uh, opened me up to this very idea of domains in conflict with each other. He talks about that. Um, and he doesn't lay it out quite the way I did. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, basically, that, that's something that Gordon almost never talked about. Uh, he wanted to keep domains separate. He wanted to keep tonality separate from meter and meter separate from you know, dynamics and dynamics separate from timbre and everything separate. And as a researcher, that makes perfect sense. You want to control variables, don't you? I mean, you want to hold certain things constant while you're measuring just that one thing. So if you're measuring melody, then darn it, you're going to measure melody and you're not going to vary, you know, you're, you're going to keep certain things controlled so that you can mm -hmm. isolate them for the sake of measurement and evaluation. But there is but what he needed was an additional stage of audiation where he talks about different domains in conflict with each other, sometimes in cooperation, but other times in conflict. And um, the closest he ever got to that was talking about how uh, a piece of music might be, for instance, um, multi-metric, uh, but uh, uh, monotemporal or, you know, uh, 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 and things like that, multi multi-tonal but, uh, but um, unimetric, things like that. But he doesn't talk about how the two things might be in conflict with each other and how we're trying to attend to the, the two at the same time and what effect that might mm -hmm. have on the listener. He never quite got to that point. I, I think that can affect learning actual content too. Like, like a, a common thing that happens when I'm teaching jazz guitar is when people are learning, sometimes people will come with, to me having learned, you know, I can... I can approach any dominant chord a step below and it's very theoretical but you know I would prefer to teach that almost like a rhythmic thing you can do if if this next chord's coming here rhythmically you can almost just step into it rhythmically so it's almost like an anacrusis but a tonal anacrusis and I, f I find that people just they just naturally learn it when you teach it like that but if you teach it as almost like a like a new tonal pattern that has to be learned next to this other tonal pattern it seems to uh, overly complicate the application of where you would actually use that. It has to be taught as a rhythmic thing, okay. even though it is a piece of tonal information in, in some sense. Um, and so it, at some point, it, um, it it becomes not useful to separate um, right. separate out the process of learning. Eric's talked about this with uh, root melody. You know, it, it, it can be very useful to actually just sing the whole melody with rhythmic inflection rather than just singing it as you know, macro beats or as, you know, whatever, right. a consistent uh, uh, rhythmic. In order to teach functions in a piece, they need to be in, in, uh, in a rhythmic context. Sure. In the context of a familiar song, it makes no sense to learn that 
the harmonic functions outside of that because what's familiar for the children is the song. And so now we've got the style and the harmony together and the melody fits on top. And then it's, so it's easier to start rhythmically with those tones, the root tones, mm -hmm. and then go from there. Right, and give them uh, some, in, in the actual singing, not during learning sequence activities, but during a classroom activity where you're teaching oh, it's root learning, melodies. To me, it's learning sequence activities. Okay, well, the, it's... The, the, yeah. to, me, to me, it, 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 so I'm able to teach these before I can teach tonal patterns. Okay. I'm teaching, I'm teaching functions before I teach tonal patterns. I'm able to teach functions to two and a half to three year olds. And they're not ready to sing tonal patterns. But if they understand harmonic functions, the tonal patterns are easy. Okay. I think that the point though is you, you, want, you, want, you don't want to restrict. You want to give the, um, the root melody some kind of rhythmic profile. And you don't want to say, mm -hmm. well, I'm focusing on the tonal dimension exclusively and I'm, I've got to wall that off. And not uh, exactly. you know, and and yeah. uh, in in actual practice, it, it's not always helpful to do that. It, for a limited amount of time, it is helpful, but beyond a certain point, it's not. Sure, and I, I, probably all of us would agree a variety is really useful. Um, there's not really a reason to only do one or the other. Yeah. But I, I just want to go back assuming. in time and 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 you know ask Dr. Gordon. You know, you've got six stages already. Would one more really kill you? You know, to have a seventh, you know, hearing multiple domains in tandem and audiating the two of them as possibly in conflict with each other. There you go. Not just hearing them that, one and the other, but one in conflict with the other. And what effect does that have on, on how yeah, the it's a, it's a combination of either the stages or it's a new stage. Yeah. Um, 4A and, and 4B. I need to look at it. Yeah, I, I went back. And, and started to rewrite the stages of audiation to include, because it's always tonal and har uh, tonal, excuse me, tonal and rhythm it, in context. There's no harmonic context yeah, in those. And, yeah. I, and I, I wonder if there's any hierarchy among those uh, or the you know, confluence of all three early aptitudes that we can measure. And, and my harmonic aptitude measure starts at two and a half, three years old versus the Audi stuff, which is hard to get unless you're precocious three and three and a half. So my, mine's easier and it's earlier. <laughs> okay. And and so that 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 you, you stay, given the stage of developmental aptitude at three versus at four or five, I've got I've got more ammo to to uh, I've got more fodder to. You know, to use uh, to make a difference as you know as early as I can. You know, to, to really to really increase, you know, the content that some of the kids are getting. That's great. On the topic of uh, contentious ideas, um, <laughs> this is the fun stuff. Uh, teaching history, teaching teaching history. So this was uh, the this was the bulk of the thrust in the, the article that you requested we check out and. Um, I think it could be common in an MLT maybe universe to th to think that te teaching history doesn't deserve classroom time. And my my experience personally, especially as a one-on-one -on -one teacher, has been that's very valuable to include some of that, especially when learning um, classical pieces or pieces that are just totally out of this time period um, to, to provide some kind of uh, historical backdrop, um, whether it's whether but whether it's learning about the country that you know the composer was from or the some kind of custom around uh, I was playing some piece today and it was some kind of dance from South America and you know personally I find that very interesting to know about you know what country was this from maybe a little bit about the the time period or the the composition customs around that time it, even though it wouldn't necessarily have to be musical content but uh, I'd love to hear how you know how you arrived at this because I think it's I think it's common in, in a lot of the musical community to think that's valuable, but maybe in the MLT community, you know, this attack on anything theoretical or intellectual comes into play, uh, even though I'm, I'm made profoundly uncomfortable by that personally. <laughs> well, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, yeah. Basically, I, I think that 
and I may be doing in my own way what Gordon sort of did with, you know, when he sort of walled off certain things, um, you know, focusing on tone and rhythm audiation, focusing on sound before sight, when so many people were digging into sight and theory to the almost total exclusion of, of any kind of musicianship. And he went whole hog with the sound part of it. And the pendulum mm -hmm. really swung in a particular direction. Um, my feeling Which is... Which we may have yeah, needed at that time. We that, may have needed someone absolutely. with a, a firm position. You know, I, I don't know of how much of a service it would have been if he was, you know, half baked on that. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. But... <laughs> and I, I don't want to, I don't want my pendulum to swing quite out, out into the, you know, into the stratosphere. But um, my, my feeling is, and this, and I hope I didn't write it in such a way that I offended my colleagues. I don't want to offend anybody. I mean, I'll, I'll offend them right now because I, you know, who knows, but maybe that's not a good idea either. So I'm going to watch what I say. Um, I, my impression is that many of the colleagues that I've talked to over the last 34 years of teaching, Many of them use history uh, as a way out, as a cop out, as a way to avoid teaching the audiational tough stuff. Um, let's learn about uh, sure. Beethoven's deafness. Let's learn about Bach's twenty children. Let's learn about um, the struggle, the personal struggles. That, I mean, you can tell in the tone of my tone of voice, I'm getting very sarcastic, and I mean to be. I mean sure. to be. It's, it's a duck and a dodge to dwell too much on, on a musical, a, a with musical after it, a musical history. Um, mm. you, should we dig into a little bit of the historical, uh, non-musical historical context of a particular piece of music? Sure. But if after a couple of minutes of a lesson of doing that, if it goes on for more than three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, I, as someone who would be watching someone teach that way, that would be a red flag for me because I'm thinking to myself, mm -hmm. what are you avoiding, Mr. or Ms. T teacher? What are, you, what are you running away from? Are you ducking the really hard job of teaching audiation by teaching about Beethoven's deafness, about the Revolutionary War, about the French Revolution, about the, the, you know, this, this particular wedding ceremony of this particular culture? Music has a history of its own. The Ritornello form predated the Rondo form and paved its way to it. Music itself mm -hmm. has a history. So, mm -hmm. and music itself provides its own context. I, I use my own uh, Jewish culture as an example, I think, in that article. And I say, if you really want to learn about Jewish culture, I can't think of any better way to do it than to learn to audiate the multi-tonality of the music sung for an hour during a Friday night service. The, 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 the service typically starts off in the Mixolydian mode and then goes crazy from there. And you hear lots of natural minor, you hear lots of gypsy minor, you hear a, a ton of Aeolian, a little bit of Phrygian, um, and then goes back to major and then might go back to gypsy minor again. It's a multi-tonal smorgasbord and it's Jewish, folks. It's Jewish. If you want to learn about Jewish culture, of course you can study the ins and outs of a Jewish bar mitzvah or wedding or, or funeral or some kind of coming of age ceremony or some kind of Jewish ceremony or ritual that we practice. That's one way to understand Jewish culture. Another way that we teachers have a unique pathway to teaching is to teach Jewish culture strictly through music. And to, mm -hmm. to teach children to understand the multi-tonality, to audiate the multi-tonality of the prayers and the service sung throughout that Friday night service. That's, that's a direct penetration into Jewish culture that we are uniquely privileged to be able to teach. And what a gift we could give our students if we could teach them to understand that. Um, so can you teach culture a, a, a different way by focusing on purely historical or cultural phenomenon that's not music related? Sure. But if it goes on for too long, my antenna stick up and I start going, mm -hmm. teacher, you're missing an opportunity. You're missing an audiational opportunity. And what a shame that would be if it goes on for too long. But I, that's, 
That's the yeah. best I can do. No, I think it's I think it's important to make those two distinctions in in terms of historical content that has no audiational um, foundation right. versus historical content that has some uh, audiational foundation. And in terms of the kind of historical facts, I, I found that when students can already play a piece and maybe they've learned a few pieces by a composer and, and have, have you know played them for. A little while they almost naturally become interested in in a small amount of historical information mm -hmm. not not like it's paving a way for a 10 minute lecture that they have to now sit through but they're almost curious like holy smokes this guy died like 300 years ago they often find that interesting um but i like the other perspective that you brought and it's something that i've thought about a lot with uh, jazz in particular um the harmonic evolution of jazz and you can really only learn that if you learn to audiate these specific kind of epochs of of jazz itself you know right from the beginning and, and kind of tracking it into more modern times but uh it's a very it's funny because if you know if you were to read kind of a history of jazz that was more um, fact-based non-musical based uh, uh, to put this in analogy with your or comparison with your um your example of learning jewish culture i don't personally feel like someone could understand the history of jazz unless they could at least understand some rhythmic and harmonic evolution in sure. in audiation based content. Uh, it, to me, it would just be it would just be a nonsensical statement uh, at at some level. Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean, I I want yeah. my students to know that uh, uh, that that uh, let's say Bach came before Beethoven, and Beethoven is using some of the the techniques and the the compositional techniques that Bach used, and he learned from he's standing on pre his predecessor's shoulders. Um, but then I would go right back to the music again. So, you know, a, a little bit of a swerve into uh, non-musical history and then right back into the music again. Only as much as I would need. Um, there's something in me, and it could be, just be a personal bias. I'm, I'm suspicious of, of music teachers and teaching that dwells too long. Um, I used to tell student teachers when I, when I had a lot of student teachers at, at one point, and some of them were having a great deal of difficulty, and I would say to them when they would launch into these you know, long talks about uh, you know, how a, a, you know, Chopin was such a private person, and you know, Haydn was so mentally well-adjusted for his time and so generous to his you know, musician friends, and they would go on and on. And I would say to them in my critique, you know, it's great that you've researched these, the, the lives of these people, but... If during a lesson, if music is not hanging in the air at any given time, ask yourself why not. You could be just done a piece of music and there's no music actually playing. You could be about ready to start a piece of music that kids have heard and they might already be audiating patterns they're about to hear. So no music might be physically present at any given time. But if music is not hanging in the air at any given moment, you should have a good reason. Um, and sometimes history, general history, is not a good enough reason. I, so I there, and especially there you if you look at the, the opportunity costs in terms of, you know, I only see most of my students for half an hour once or twice a week. That's, that's my typical schedule. So, to, you know, 60 minutes a week is kind of the, the ceiling for most of my students. So to take up any of that time with, content that's not helping them progress as musicians is uh, inherently suspicious. <laughs> right. But then you're giving them a little bit of historical context just for a dab to, so what I do is I generally during my movement stuff with three and four year olds and I have 45 minutes or an hour, uh, even up to five year olds, I'll, play something that's bombastic, orchestral, you know, fun, heavy, you know, energetic. And right after that, I'll play some, some uh, jazz thing that just goes from pianissimo to, the, you know, fortissimo, and, and then comes right back to, to silence at the very, very end. That they're experiencing this, not that, mm -hmm. and I'll put contrasting things uh, right next to each other, and I don't explain anything. You know, yeah. they're three, they're four. I'm just having them experience differences in their body, 
here's this kind of piece and here's this kind of piece and I try to you know I, I almost never do two orchestral things in a row you know and when I even get to my older children when I'm teaching a theory quote-unquote class um, in the other department it's not mine uh, I, I teach you know band orchestra band orchestra band band orchestra or you know back and forth which comes to this is the, the thing that I have in common, and Gordon had, of course, is the same different article that you just, uh, blog post that you just wrote. Oh, too. thank you for it. That's but, a, that was a fun one. I enjoyed that one a lot. Uh, yeah. So, you want to speak about what that is specifically? And Well, sure. Um, I'm, I'm putting together, and in fact, I, I just published an introduction to it today on my blog about dynamics, because um, whenever I talk about teaching dynamics, I get a lot of pushback, and sometimes I get pushback from MLT folks. They say, why on earth would you want to teach dynamics? Don't you know that kids have been learning? You know, they've been hearing fire trucks their whole life, and they've been hearing whispers their whole life, and they... Blah, 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 blah. And I would say to them, but not in a musical context, they haven't. So you can never assume that kids can hear what you think they can hear. Um, and I usually reserve teaching dynamics, uh, uh, teaching you know, uh, kids to um, aud uh, orally discriminate between forte and piano. And I use the terms forte and piano and dynamic level and things like that. I usually reserve that for my second graders. Well, second grade is a very interesting time for kids. Uh, because by the end of second grade, they're starting to think differently. And by the beginning of third grade, they're really thinking differently. And by fourth grade, same and different has, is basically played out. Um, they're starting to think categorically. They're starting to think about like and different as opposed to same and different. Um, but before the age of, let's say, five or six, uh, when you're talking about, and, and Eric, you would probably know much more about this because you really, you see a lot of the preschool kids that I only used to see decades ago, but you, you know, your whole career is seeing them. But um, Gordon wrote a, a really fascinating monograph many, many decades ago in the early 80s called, um, I believe, The Manifestation of Same and Different as Sound in Music. Uh, I don't have the exact Same, title. Sameness, Manifestation of Sameness and Difference. Yeah, let me, you know what, I'm going to, I think, I think, okay, while I'm talking, I'm going to sort of get to it, because it's a recent thing. Um, I might be confusing it also with uh, uh, John Hollihan's uh, dissertation. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's. Where he, where he re went really deep into sameness and difference. It's a fascinating subject. Here, here's the title. And then right? I, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Go the ahead. title, <clears throat> and that's a long one, for, uh, surprisingly. The manifestation, I don't mean to be sarcastic, the, manifest nope. the manifestation of developmental music aptitude in the audiation of same and different as sound in music. And basically what he's getting at, he's, he's sort of hinting toward the end of it about stages of development that he never really talked about in great detail after that. He kind of built them, baked them into the skill learning sequence to a certain mm -hmm. extent, but he never fully came out and said, here are the stages of development with regard to same and different that children go through from preschool up through high school. He never did that, and I always wish that he had, but it was only recently that I read this monograph. I, I, I bought it the last time we were at the conference. It was, it was at the bottom of a bin. Uh, it was the last copy. And I said, oh, my goodness, I've never seen this before. I've got to read it because this is a big one. This is not some small paper where he basically restates certain things. This was a groundbreaking paper, and I had never read it. Um, and basically, the upshot is that very young children have no concept of same or different. This is pre audi stuff. This is real yeah. young. Yeah. There's no this such... 1980... Middle age. Well, pre, pre audi for kids, not just for Gordon. It's pre audi. Yeah. It's it's ages six months, nine months, one year. Same or different is not in their ballpark. The the idea of difference is simply not something that they attend to because everything is different. There are no two things that are the same. Sameness and difference simply don't apply 
in, in, their, in their mental geography. And I use the example in the paper of, imagine that you're walking north, and you keep walking to the North Pole, and you keep walking and walking and walking, and you, the big day arrives, and you set foot right smack onto the North Pole, and you're as far north as you can possibly get. Okay, what does north mean to you? Nothing. The, I, the concept of northness has lost its value because you've gone as far north as you can. There's no such thing as north anymore because everything around you is north. Everything. It's the same with kids and difference. There's no such thing as different because everything is different. But when they start noticing that this pencil that I'm pretending to hold up and this pencil, which is exactly the same size and color, are the same, something clicks in the mind of a five or six-year-old that, okay, they're not exactly the same because one is in one hand and one is in the other, but this grown-up is telling me that they're the same. And I'm starting to get the idea that, yes, they look the same and they're the same size. And so, okay, there's, an, there's the concept of sameness now. And when I hold up a, 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 you know, a, a stapler and a pencil, they can really tell that those things are different. Um, because, you know, if, if these two things are the same, these two things must be different. And so kids, you know, ages five, six, and seven are fascinated with same and different. And when I used mm -hmm. to administer um, IMMA to my six and seven-year-olds especially, they would never get tired of me holding up different visuals to help them with the test, you know, before they took it. It would never bore them. And I was always fascinated with the fact that, I mean, it bores me stiff to talk about same and different. But these six-year-olds and seven-year-olds are fascinated with the notion of same and different. They could play same and different all day long and never get tired of it. Not so with eight and nine-year-olds. Not so. They're bored and they want to move on from something so mundane and commonplace. They want to move on to one of these things is not like the others from Sesame Street. They want to move on to the car, the truck, and the bus yeah. are not exactly the same, but that doesn't matter. They belong in the same category because they're all vehicles. And this screwdriver does not belong with those other three because it's not a vehicle. They've moved on to like and different. They're starting to think categorically as opposed to being fascinated by mere same and different. Well, my second graders, this is the point of why I've constructed the, um, the unit as I have. My second graders are, are toward the end of the school year, just approaching that threshold where same and different no longer applies to their lives. They're just not interested in it. And they're starting to think categorically. And by the beginning of third grade, they're really starting to. Um, maybe they haven't crossed that line yet, um, but same and different is pretty much played out. So when I start doing my dynamic unit, really around December, January of the school year. By, by June, I no longer need to rely on, here's one 15 second example or 10 second example, here's another 10 second example, are they the same or different? Because same and different is not something that fascinates them anymore. And, it, and frankly, it's not even something they need to worry about anymore. Now with the older kids, I don't even talk about same and different. When I'm doing my vocal register unit or I'm doing something with orchestral timbre differences, um, I just go right to the differences in the, and, and, uh, and what belongs in each category. Uh, I don't have to worry about can they really audiate same and different before I start naming categories. I know that they'll be able to. And with first grade, when I'm doing my genre stuff, is what they hear orchestral or is what they hear uh, purely vocal or is it a combination? That's pretty tough stuff for first grade. But so at the beginning of the year, and they can do it. But at the beginning of the school year and periodically throughout the school year, I test the waters by introducing sameness and difference. Every time I introduce some new bit of content that they haven't heard before or some kind of comparison that's new for them, I always start with same and different, always. But that's first grade. In second grade, I begin my unit that way, and I gradually move beyond it. Yeah, I can poke at this a little okay. bit, and I'm also curious about something else, is that Gordon eventually changed his responses to same, different, to same, not same, oh. in the harmonic improvisation and the, and the rhythmic improvisation readiness records. So it was same, not same, versus same, different. Now, and I'm curious why you think he 
moved that I direction. was just about to ask you, what do you think the significance of that is? Is it, is it just because he got uh, more reliable responses? Yeah, I think that's why, actually, because uh, uh, Engelman talks about the same thing where for a lot of people, if you you have them, if you're trying to induce a concept through examples, there's so many possible things it could be like you. You show the example, you hold up two pencils. The student doesn't know if you're talking about the color, the shape, the what hand they're in, the position, the closeness, the size. You know, you're trying to talk about the category of pencil and you have to do that through examples. Some students seem to get confused when you use two different pieces of vocabulary so rather rather than having same and different just having same and then negative same or not same it seems to make it easier for people just to, to process and yeah i don't know what do you think about yeah. that eric it I, could be i i i didn't seem to have too much of a problem with it with the um uh with imma the, the, the kids could handle that pretty well um but gordon might have been onto mm -hmm. something uh yeah, Who knows? I, I, I remember yeah. this. I remember this story where he was talking about it in one of the classes or or might have been at the conference at some point that he was uh, frustrated with a three year old that wouldn't talk to him about this is, you know, these are the same. These are different. And one was they're very literal about space. So here's. A pencil in this space and here's a pencil a second pencil in a different space they're not the same because they're right. even though they're occurring at the same right. time they're exactly the same by our standard right. they're not the same in her in her because they're occupying occupying space and then so here's the pencil I'm only going to use one pencil you take it away here's the pencil is this pencil the same as this pencil and here's this precocious girl saying those aren't the same because they're occurring in different time, not just space, right? So here's the, I, no, that was sure. the pencil you showed me before. It's not the pencil you're showing That's me now right. because, because now I, because they have a distinction of, you know, pre, they're present to the pencil sure. now having learned they about what they saw about the, so they're constantly growing and changing. So they're different from the five, you know, minutes ago that, that this, you started engaging them in the conversation sure. so they're growing they know they're not the same they know the pencils aren't the same that's so funny that you, different space you said it, yeah or different time and so he was talking he was getting rigorous with this precocious three-year-old and and he said so there's your mommy you know is your daddy different than your mommy or the same as your mommy and she couldn't answer the question and he drove her to the point where he like just shut up. That's my mommy. That's not my mommy. Oh, which is a perfect okay. three-year-old thing to say. And that was the aha moment that Dr. Gordon shared uh, wherever it was I heard this story. And I, it stuck with me. Um, and so that's one component of this conversation. The other thing I want to I wanna say is Sandra Treehub. I'm sure you're familiar with her early childhood research if not she's a canadian early childhood uh invest scientist uh investigator well i'm not uh, so i'm glad i'm she, hearing about it from you. okay all right so what she's done is studies with prenatal uh children uh and and children who are just out of the womb and you know there's mommy's voice and there's daddy's voice they prefer mommy's voice right then you got mommy's voice another mom's voice Right? They prefer mommy's voice um, by, by either sucking faster or whatever. But they could play a song that mom sang it while they were in utero and a song that wasn't. And the children respond to the song that's different with faster sucking, a song that's unfamiliar. So they, they recognize differences right without any vocabulary uh familiarity um so it gets along the way eventually what you're saying is true in the linguistic world but i think there's a pre-linguistic world you know the pre-audiational development where um i'm just contrasting always contrasting always contrasting always contrasting tonalities and meters and what something is what something is not is more important than having the capacity 
to name sameness and difference or to name sameness and not sameness, which is easier. So it's like, is this the same? No. Is this the same? Yes. Or Right. Or later on to name like and different. But, but what you're saying is completely valid. And there is, the, Oops, I think, yeah. the readiness for the use of that vocabulary uh, conceptually and then uh, musically if they've gotten enough uh, contrast, if they've gotten enough experience uh, early on, the same way as you need the experience in utero of mom speaking and mom singing so that they come out and they have better readiness uh, for language development. There are other concepts that are better taught like that too, like not just same and different. Like I know uh, if you teach foreign concepts like hot and cold, it's easier to teach a positive label for one of them, so hot, and then teach cold separately after you've taught not hot. So you, you teach them to equate not hot with cold, but at first you just teach them hot and not hot because then there's only one label that they have to navigate with, um, which is interesting. The you know, you gave that example. Um, I was thinking, I this was a couple months ago. I played, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star in major and minor for one of my students, and I, I asked them if they're the if they're the same or different. And this um, this girl was like they're the same, and she was like, obviously, like they're different. But but what she was really attending to was that they're the same song. So she she kind of, you know, in passing was like, yeah, of course they're they're different. Like one's in minor. But she was really answering the question, like, are they the same song? And I think that's one thing I, I haven't heard Gordon talk a lot about that I've heard other people in the same and different sphere talk about is that there's a way you can strategically structure the examples you give so that the student is aware of what you're even talking about. Because if, if you give a tonality test and you're just asking, are these the same or different, you don't actually know if the student is validly saying, like, yeah, that motif is the same. Or instead of, you know, yeah, it, no, the tonality is different because you haven't taught them uh, which domain that they're supposed right. to be paying attention to necessarily because they don't have the vocabulary to respond to you telling What's the them the context, that. if the context was form or, or um, melodic contour or, right, or rhythm. But I wonder how often that happens where you give someone a tonality, uh, you know, someone's taking a test in, um, like, I can't remember the name of the, the, the test I took. Eric, the little am I yep. musical? Forty questions. It's just three chords, bing, bang, boom, and they ask you if something's the same or different, right? Um, but I found I found that interesting. Um, this this idea of how you structure examples to to, to do that because I think I think you could provide positive and negative examples just haphazardly and hope that they pick up on it, but. Like, for example, if you're to, if you want to dependably teach someone the difference between left and right, you can structure the examples in a way that would almost guarantee they're going to sensorily understand what you're trying to bring out rather than just randomly saying this is left, this is right. You can structure the examples in a way where that would help bring that out. And I think you can do the same thing um, with whether it's tonal patterns or rhythm patterns or, or, or anything like that. Because, uh, Eric, you were talking about when you introduce new content, you like to compare it with old content. Um, and I'm assuming you're talking about with, with tonal patterns or, or rhythm patterns, things like that, or, or other types of content? Generally speaking, yeah. When I'm introducing something new, uh, I, I compare it with something old. It's something familiar, yeah. Yeah. At yeah, that's what I found with... Um, I, I've, I've stopped kind of introducing tonal patterns as a string of like... 10 you know plus patterns yes. at a time and i i just do them one at a time and when i when i introduce a new one when i'm labeling it you know they're singing whatever but when i introduce a new one i just compare it with some old ones and make sure if, if they're not firm on the the, the new one versus the old ones I, I definitely don't want to throw more uh, uh, on top of that but uh yeah it's interesting that's something that I've, I've, I've it just seems very useful because if they can discriminate you know, against what they're already familiar with, it it seems to um, sit alongside you know their old knowledge base a little more firmly. Yeah, it's kind of kind of an MLT yeah. rule of thumb if you're if you're um, introducing a new bit of content, uh, it, 
c compare it with the old and te you know don't don't introduce one new skill and one new bit of content at the same time and uh, you, you know introduce everything at the oral oral level mm -hmm. and then proceed from there um there there are certain keys to the kingdom that that uh really what fascinates me is that they apply to just about every domain of, of music that you yeah. can think of not just the tonal and rhythm domains but they're they're mm -hmm. golden for for so many things that that we music teachers uh, uh want to teach yeah this mm -hmm. same different phenomenon is is pervasive throughout education i think and and the better we understand the difference with that and and same not same as we get you know younger in age and then before that that they have experiences of, of so many different contextual right uh, uh, understandings for whatever it is that the whatever the domain is that we're working with them yeah. um uh but they all ring true uh, uh and and then the thing that's got me really juiced right now like an, another large step for me to take over my last you know few years of teaching however many i'll maybe i'll be around for 20 more years i don't know but is incorporating this theory of instruction by engelman uh i'll send you the pdf uh it yeah no you, you did send it to me it's a it's a it's a long piece, so I've only had a chance to sort yeah. of skim through it. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad I sent it. It's just it's it's remarkable how, you know, Engelman was really onto the same things Gordon was onto. He just wasn't teaching music, and it, it it's interesting to see like John Stuart Mill knew about this stuff too. You know, his I forget the name of his little pamphlet, but his principles of scientific logic. You know, how to use a scientific method. Um, it's it's essentially talking about how to s structure same and difference. It, when you present examples so somebody can come up with the right category through induction so you know how you would present say examples of major uh versus examples of minor because i think what a lot of teachers do is they present many positive examples like here's a major song here's a major song and they try to just say that's major but you you can't learn what major is unless you have something that's not sure. major and you know if you it, it's just interesting how uh you were saying this 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 applies through so many different domains of music, not just tonality and, and rhythm, but this seems to be just a, like something that's at the bedrock of the mind for how it creates categories at large. I'm just I'm just grateful to Gordon because he it is it is bedrock and it and it and it does cut across and go across so many disciplines and so many theorists have come up with it independently. Uh, but uh, I, I'm just grateful that we had someone like Gordon who kept hammering. You know the idea that you you just have to keep comparing. You know we learn by making comparisons, mm -hmm. and and it's also it struck me as you know that when teachers don't do that, there's something. You know I don't want to sound malicious, but there's something authoritarian about saying to students, "This is the way it is because I say so." Uh, major is major because I say so. This is the sound of it, and yep. I'm not going to give you any anything to help you to discover for yourself what major sounds like. I'm just going to tell you what it is, and you'll absorb it because I say so. And then you'll resort mm -hmm. to whole step, half step theory. That's, that's right, and then you have to resort to I mean, we to actually things, see but... the same problems show up in, yeah. other, in other types of education, like math education suffers from many of the same problems that Gordon was talking about with music education. Kind of the meat that's supposed to be on the bone is not being addressed, you know, in different educational domains, not even... Right. Just and, music. and when we when we do teach kids to make comparisons, to to discriminate and and to draw inferences, we give them the tools to do that. We're avoiding that kind of um, uh, autocratic uh, kind of uh, teaching. You know, we 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 can steer around it deliberately. Uh, we don't have to lapse into it. And uh, so it's a it's a great gift that he, that he's given us. I think. Um, yeah, I think it's a great. Um... It's a great set of concepts just to understand because I think once you get your, once you wrap your head around, you know, really what's the principles underlying what's in um, learning sequences of music or theory of instruction, it, it makes other areas of life very interesting. Like I was telling Eric, I, I started math tutoring recently just out of pure interest. I have no history of teaching math or anything, but, um, you know, if you just apply some of the stuff to teaching 10th grade math, it becomes profoundly interesting. You know, how do you present the examples and how do you present comparisons in a way where they're really learning to, you know, in an analogy, audiate the math. They're not just uh, learning the symbol, push sure, the symbols. You're, you're giving them tools 
as opposed to being um, yeah. uh, authoritarian and telling them, these are the tools that I have, so accept that. No, I'm giving you the tools. I'm, you know, I'm teaching you how to catch a fish. So it's, it's the old saw. Um, you, you know something that would be neat? This is off the, so the topics of what we've been talking about. It's what we started with, though. And it's something that I know almost nothing about, so I'm going to dive into it anyway. Uh, space audiation. I know you didn't want to talk about <laughs> space audiation. But when I started remembering and thinking about what I had heard Gordon talk about it, there are a lot of parallels between uh, sp what he thought of as space audiation and, and how I learned how to write and, and, uh, and what I've been trying to do with my writing. Um, one time I was in Gordon's office. This was, well, back when he was still at Temple, and he was not quite ready to leave, but pretty close. And we were talking about diff uh, what makes a piece of writing difficult. And he was very sensitive about this subject. I, I think it, it was truly heartbreaking for him uh, that so many people found his books difficult. Uh, it, it really was a, fr a, a, a tremendous frustration for him um, that he couldn't go the, the step to help people understand him better through his writing. And um, he, we were talking about vocabulary. And I brought up one of my heroes at the time, a, a linguist named Rudolf Flesch, who um, I still think whenever I go back and read his books, I sometimes go for a year or two without digging into one, and sometimes I'll take one of his books off the shelf, and I'll say, kindred spirit. There's, there's, there's my, uh, my spirit helper right there. But his big thing was a little bit different from Strunk and White, who always advised what, what Daryl advises, basically, which is omit needless words. Flesh went in a different direction. He said, don't omit needless, don't, don't assume that a word is needless. Don't, you know, of course, you, want to, you don't want to waste words, um, and you want to cut out what words that are truly unnecessary. You don't want to use expressions like in addition to, in conjunction with, and all the isms and ations and alities that go with the English language. You want to go slow on stuff like that. But he talked about the fact that what makes a piece of writing difficult is not the words. It's the white space on the page in between the words. And I mentioned that to Dr. Gordon, and he went crazy in his office. He was so excited by that idea. He was just, oh, interesting, Eric, interesting. Let me go on. And then he went on about space audiation a little bit. But I think he and Rudolf Flesch were onto the same thing. But in a practical sense, it's understanding uh, how to use and not misuse in between space in language that has been the biggest factor in teaching me how to write and present things clearly. It's not about vocabulary. It's about using and manipulating the white space in between the words. And it takes a long time to learn how to do it. It means, yeah. it means tapping into your own speech rhythm, really listening to yourself, and trying to simulate the way you speak and putting that on paper. Yeah. Um, it's hard to do. But once you do yeah. it, you never go back. You, you never... Chasing, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, chasing flow, which Daryl, when we were, uh, when we were uh, rating graduate level papers, uh, paragraphs for their final exam in this graduate writing class that was, you know, university-wide writing class, the, one, of the, one of the components we rated, you know, was clarity, all the, all the normal things, even grammar. Uh, but flow was one of those things that if, if you read and it encompassed flow and helped with your uh, ease of reading, then that was one of the, you know, the higher level writers if they achieved a level of flow. Um, and that, if that weren't incorporated, the, the writing wasn't quite as good as something that's utterly perfect, uh, w but without flow. Yeah, and the flow varies from speaker to speaker, writer to writer. Uh, it's a personal. It, it is a very personal thing to capture your own voice on paper. May I? May I just? I know we're almost out of time, but may I read a short excerpt? I have it here, just thinking that you know, hoping this topic would come up. This is a, 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 from a very early book by Rudolf Flesch that he wrote back in 1946. 
and he talked about how some of his colleagues who he, he taught a writing course at New York University at, at NYU for decades. And he said even back then, a lot of his colleagues were focused on grammar and a lot of them were focused on, on um, you know, even omitting needless words and, and follow, following a certain uh, almost recipe or a series of recipes for how to write clearly. And, and this is what he had to say uh, about that. He says, you know, uh, grammar, well, he, he was suspicious of grammar and learning grammar as a tool for teaching people to listen uh, to themselves. In the same way that Gordon was suspicious of, of music theory as a substitute for audiation. He wasn't just suspicious of it, he, he rejected it. <laughs> um, this, is, this is flesh. He said, well, then you will say, if simplified grammar is out and slow paced sentences are out and limited vocabulary is out, how can we simplify our prose style? How does anyone achieve plain talk anyhow? For strange as it may seem to you at this point, people talk plainly as long as they don't think about it. In conversation, without rehearsal or preparation, they somehow manage to express themselves so clearly that nobody asks for an explanation. How do they do it? The solution to the puzzle is easy. They use big words and a fast pace and the ordinary rules of grammar, but they give the other fellow time to understand. They pause between sentences. They repeat themselves. They use filler words between the big important ones. They space their ideas. The secret of plain talk is in between space. Wowzers, man. So in the context of uh, the upcoming episode uh, with Jim Jordan, which we will spend some time on his conversation with Dr. Gordon about space audiation, that's quite a morsel yeah. to whet our appetite with. And the thing is, I always wanted to say, and Daryl and I have sort of had this conversation briefly, but I say, you know, don't, don't put too much stock in eliminating needless words because it's possible to eliminate word after word after word and forget about language density. For, you're, you're forgetting about the in-between space. You don't want to forget about that. You want to use anecdotes. You want to talk conversationally. You want to use punctuation and vary your punctuation because punctuation is all about rhythm. It's not about grammar. You know, in Shakespeare's day, uh, sh uh, pun punctuation was used to help the actor with pauses and with, with speech patterns. And you want to use punctuation that way today. Uh, you want to use colloquial expressions. You want to introduce stories and things that remind you of this, that, and the other. And you don't want to be afraid to digress because digressions can help your reader. And all those things might add words. So while you're cutting out needless words in, a, let's say, a thousand-word essay, you cut it down to 500 words. Great. But add maybe an extra 100 or 200 to get it up to 700. Not as bad as before. But as you're shrinking, you want to expand also. Don't omit needless words to the extent that you create such a dense piece of prose that you forget about the in-between space. Because you want to leave audiation time for your reader. And mm -hmm. wow. You know, so you, you get the combination of Daryl and Rudolf Flesch in, you know, what, the, what a gift that I gave him after the dissertation was over, after that whole ordeal was done, and I was a doctor, I said to him, Dr. Walters, I still call him Dr. Walters, I said, I have to give you a gift. And I ordered on, um, on uh, off of Amazon.com every single book that Rudolf Flesch ever wrote. And I had a big stack of books, and I said, here, this is my gift to you. They're yours. Read them. Don't read them. Uh, but I, I didn't want to leave this planet without giving you everything that Rudolf Flesch wrote. You can do what I've done with it. You can read it and fight with it and argue with him because he makes some outlandish claims about writing and about communication in general. But you'll find something stimulating in every chapter of every book, and it'll spark your thinking. And sure enough, in his books, if you look at the glossary, you'll find that Rudolf Flesch is sprinkled throughout his, his books pretty liberally, a lot of the stuff that he did end up agreeing with. So, uh, no, I think that's, I think that's really well put. And, you know, I, I instantly see a lot of analogy between harnessing writing pace and flow and, and, and using the space 
um, really to support delivering the message, not as just because uh, you talked about how this idea, this rule of thumb, will just subtract that it's not necessarily related with helping deliver the message in a way. It's, it's a it's a shorthand that might often get someone to that point, but it's not really the right path to go down because it may or may not have anything to do with the idea being transmitted in a way right. that's useful. But I see this with improv. You know, you, you have a novice improviser who's basically just rambling and there's no coherence to the, their ideas. So someone says, play less notes. But you listen to Chick Corea improvise, there's not less notes. There's more time to dis digest the ideas and the motifs, the way the ideas are, are placed and how they're punctuated with repetition. Repetition might make it easier to absorb something that's fast, for example. But it, the, the analogy here is just subtraction is often wise under under another context but subtraction as just like a rule of thumb doesn't necessarily give That's you where the analogy the that you're after. drives off the road eventually well right. it, yeah it, but i really see it with improv yeah. you know th with this harnessing of space and um it's not like there's anything wrong with a lot of notes in a, in a piece of improv but uh there's something more to just relying on some kind of uh, rule of thumb that, that says just right. take notes the, re the recipes example um you know, Flesh wrote uh, books similar to Daryl's about how about how to cut you know words out uh, in a way that will save the reader time. And this is this is the paradox too. I don't want to forget to mention this that even though yes, mm -hmm. the secret to plain talk is in between space, but what you want to achieve ultimately is a, a true brevity. That brevity is not about saving trees. It's not about you know, using less space on your computer. Brevity is not about saving space. It's about saving your reader time. And if you write a really densely packed 20-word sentence that is, or 10-word sentence that is very difficult to read, that makes the reader go back and go back and go back and say, I still don't get this, or you expand it to a free-flowing uh, series of paragraphs that includes digressions, that includes examples, that includes conversational language, that includes varied punctuation, that includes a simulation of the way you would naturally talk if you were a perfect conversationalist, you know, and, and had edited your work nicely. Okay, well, the, the upshot is that, that brevity is about saving the reader time. It's not about saving space on your hard drive or saving space on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why I think the when the goal you know of the the sentence or the paragraph or or the idea is put in mind you know did the brevity support the transmission of the idea or was I bowing to the god of brevity for brevity's sake for for uh, yeah just as something that I have to check off I have to do even though it's not connected right. to and and is it truly brief in the mind of the yeah. reader um, did did it take them an hour to digest something that if I had written it uh, maybe more expansively, but more clearly, they could have digested in five or ten minutes. So, yeah, neat, Interesting neat stuff. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential to, you know, put that through uh, all these different domains of music. So, Eric, uh, when I was all finished, I gave Daryl a book. Oh, called the Unfolding of Language, about the evolution of language over time. And how words develop, you know, because he used to complain about how contemporaries would speak. <laughs> and you go back and look, and we all say, you know, what what are you doing? You know, how are you doing? We don't say, how are you doing? <laughs> like it would have been, right? So how did all these things evolve eventually to sup? <laughs> hey, what's right. up? Yeah. What's up? You know, it's like, and so sup might... You know, it might even be in the dictionary. They keep adding. Uh, but it, it's a really wonderful uh, read uh, on a more uh, macro level <laughs> on, on language. Uh, uh, P-O-U-R in French is four. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the folks in rural France, that took a lot extra energy with your mouth than it would be to say four. Four. You've got to put your lips together. Four, you don't. It's just an easier way. And and so the mispronunciation, mispronunciation am I saying the right word? Am I saying it right? The mispronunciation of the word 
poor by the people that were illiterate out in the fields, right, in 14th century France, eventually became poor uh, along the way. Across the channel, then that's... And, and across the channel, and there, that's why we say poor, is because poor is too hard to say. It's it's really neat. Uh, there's a um, just a yeah, I know I know we're getting off the topic of music, but it's a fascinating the evolution of language fascinates me. There's a um, yeah. the biblical linguists can can pinpoint in a piece of ancient Hebrew uh, what century it was written in, and and they can tell the difference between let's say 10th century BC Hebrew as opposed to 5th century BCE Hebrew, and they can pinpoint with reasonable accuracy. What really are some of the oldest passages in the Bible? And it turns out the Song of the Sea um, it, from Exodus is much older than anything in Genesis. Um, the Song of the Sea is, is the oldest thing linguistically that they've been able to pinpoint um, because uh, through, uh, through linguistic um, understanding that I will forever elude me, uh, they can tell just by the sentence structure, the word usage. Um, mm -hmm that this is old stuff. And, and the J author is the, the, the oldest writer, followed by the E author, followed by someone who combined the J and the E stories. And um, one writer, a, a brilliant linguist named Richard Elliot Friedman, uh, who wrote a book called, um, uh, who wrote the Bible, he said, one of the great things about studying this stuff is that I can see the flowering of this ancient language over the centuries. I, I can see how the earliest parts were written, and then how they were added to and possibly modified and changed. And it's like the opening of this beautiful flower to emerge, mm -hmm. you know, this, this book that was written by perhaps 75 different people over a period of six or seven centuries. Um, yeah. But to, to see that unfold as a linguist, what a, what a gift that must be to be yeah. able to do that. So Guy, Guy Deutscher, uh, The Unfolding of Language. You'll really enjoy it. It was one of the best books I've read. Guy Deutscher. Okay. Uh, is it available through Amazon? Yeah. Okay. The Unfolding of Language. It's, really, it's a really good read. So on the topic of recommended books, I, you know, you've piqued my interest in Rudolph Flesh. Cool. Um, do you have a recommendation for a first book to get into for myself or listeners, if you are going to you know, voyage out into one that? One of his great books, um, one of my favorite books is called, it, it's only indirectly related to writing. But the writing is so gorgeous that it's all modeling on his part about how to do it. It's called The Art of Clear Thinking. It was written in 1951. Um, and I think it's his most consistently successful book. Uh, he, he talks about, well, he talks about many things. And I don't want to give some stuff away, but he does talk about language density. He talks about um, abstractness in writing versus concreteness in writing and how to, how to minimize and make use of your abstract thoughts and put them in concrete terms and how not to lapse into such complete abstraction that you lose your reader completely, um, which is something that Gordon un unfortunately uh, did forget about. So much of his writing is abstract mm -hmm. and so little of it has to do with concrete reality. And that's a shame because it doesn't have to be that way. Um, but that's where I would start. I would start with a book called, yeah. That is interesting in terms of, you know, the... The reported difficulty with reading learning sequences in music, you know, something that is notorious among this community. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard the story, but learning sequences in music was mailed to me, and that is how I found out about Edwin Gordon. That was my first exposure. But, you know, I, I, I had an experience with dealing with dense philosophy texts, and I could audiate quite well, and I had arrived at a lot of the same ideas in, like, you know, seedling form i obviously wasn't fleshed out but i had a, a strong theory for you know the fact that i could audiate and i could see people that couldn't audiate that were playing instruments so when i read the book a lot of it made sense because it seemed quite concrete in that sense that oh this guy's really talking like technically specifically about something that i've had on my mind for a while and i wonder if that's not the reason that a lot of people struggle with learning sequences of music is because that is essentially very abstract to them because they have no concrete um, awareness of the of their own audiation process before they even start reading the book okay. itself, or they're they're um, going in they're going in cold. They haven't read they haven't 
they don't have a, a, at least a basic understanding of it, which was my problem going into it in exactly. the mid-80s. But, you know, I'll tell you my salvation, right? you know, how I got into it was through Gordon's uh, lectures. Some of them uh, were published by GIA, but a lot of the ones that I listened to were more informal talks that he gave uh, here in Philadelphia, right out, uh, across the street from the Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia, a place called the Sugarloaf Conference Hall. And they were all in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Eric, you would remember, the Presser Learning Center. They were all on a top mm -hmm. shelf in the Presser Learning Center gathering dust, dozens and dozens of talks from 1980, 81, 82. And I knew that I'm a, a, an auditory learner. I mean, that's that's how I learn best. Um, and so I started yep. listening to those lectures and I got hooked. Those are online, actually, if people want so, to listen to some them. Of them because I, I found them about a year ago. And when I was listening to them, I, I thought, man, this would have been really useful like mm -hmm. five years ago. So, and uh, some yeah. of them are available. And some of the lectures uh, that, that were published by GIA are still available. Uh, and they're also very good. Mm -hmm. I would love them because Gordon was a much better talker to me, or at least his talking reached me in a way that his writing didn't, he would digress. He would get interrupted. He would lose his train of thought. He would bring in analogies. He would talk about experiences that he had that day with a student. And I thought, yes, yes, he's doing everything right in his talking. And sometimes he would introduce an idea <clears throat> in 1981 and then someone would open the door and say, uh, so-and-so, your lights are on uh, outside. Oh, okay, we'll continue this some other time. Or so-and-so, there's a phone message for you. And he would get interrupted. Well, in a lecture in 1983, someone would ask him the same question, and then he would finish his thought. So I thought to myself, you know, when I'm listening to this, you have to know the lecture from 1981 to know where he's finishing his paragraph in 1983. Um, and I did, because I'm kind of compulsive that way. I knew the whole lecture series, and I would listen to them over and over and over again to the point where I practically memorized them. So when it came time to write my book, mm -hmm. I wrote it in one summer, and it was a flash flood. I just It just burst out of me because I knew this stuff, um, and I filtered it through my own experience teaching and through my own personality. But it was through just listening and listening and listening over and over and over again. Um, that I was able to do it. And when I finally got around to reading his book seriously, um, it still was almost like reading a foreign language to me, but I knew the basics of it to know, okay, he's speaking and writing really abstractly, but I get where he's coming from. I, I, I get how that paragraph should have been written. I get it. I get what he's trying to say. And he said it so beautifully in a lecture where he got interrupted and he digressed and, and he brought in anecdotes that seemed to be far afield but I, I get it. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons we found that the podcast medium has been so helpful for exploring these ideas. I mean, in this podcast, we haven't necessarily had the goal of, of trying to yeah. get someone to understand or the basics of MLT, but we're just interested in kind of, you know, who's in the scene and, and talking about uh, kind of what's on people's minds. And I, I really prefer doing it through a spoken. Sure. Medium. And everybody learns differently. And there's for people who, who do learn better through reading than through listening and don't want to sit through hours and hours of lectures that Gordon did back in the 80s. We talked a lot about him on this podcast, Daryl Walters. He is the best writer on MLT. I mean, to this day, other people mm. besides me have written about MLT, and there are some very fine books that have just recently been published about it. But Daryl remains, his writing remains the finest. His writing is at least in my opinion, I don't know if Eric agrees with me, his writing is the gold standard on MLT. If you can... On just about anything. Or just about it. anything he's written, but certainly about music learning theory. His, his, he, stuff, yeah. his stuff is fabulous. Um, and and uh, where my writing is more roundabout and uh, maybe more conversational, but also uh, less... Um, uh, less uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the only thing my writing doesn't have is a, a, a kind of brevity that he achieves. Efficiency is the word I'm looking for. My writing is not efficient. His is. And it's also beautifully undense. He manages to achieve those two things. Mm. So if you, ha if, you, if you learn through the written word better than the spoken word and you want to get something beautifully written about MLT, 
please go to Dr. Walt, please go to Daryl Walter's writing. It's it's state of the art. Excellent. My thank you note for the dinner I treated to him after, you know, graduating with my doctorate is I keep that around just every once in a while. It gives me a little boost. What's that? I'm sorry. The the, the his thank you note. Oh. For the dinner that we took him to after the you know, oh, I didn't do that. Maybe I should have done that. Yeah. I don't think I took him out to dinner. I should have done that. Maybe yeah. I, I, there's still time. I can well, do it. You gave him. You gave him a bunch of books. It's going to last forever. That's true. <laughs> we gave him a meal. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> Feast for the mind. Absolutely. I gave him one one book and one and one meal. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. And I really appreciate all the recommendations. I'm I'm excited to get on to Rudolph Flesh because. Uh, you're a very well-spoken speaker, <laughs> uh, probably one of the better well-spoken uh, people we've had on the podcast. So I'm very uh, well, thank you. thankful we got the chance to connect with you and very. We'll invite you back when we when we have some some more contentious topics. I I definitely okay. I don't. There, there might there might be one or two things that we disagree with. I I I don't know. I don't know if there are. I um. I, I think one one thing is I, I see M MLT going down a particular track where I think some people are perhaps too uh, focused on uh, teaching about harmonic progressions and things like that and improvisation. Not that any of that is bad. It's certainly necessary, and it's so undernourished in typical music instruction. But I think that there are so many avenues that uh, where MLT can help us in other domains of, of music that uh, that should be equally explored. So. That's that might be the only thing, but that's that's a matter of emphasis. You know, it's not it's not really a difference. Yeah, yeah. Purpose. Purpose driven. Context driven. Everything is context. Everything. Right? Everything. All right. Well, thank you for so much for joining us. Uh, join. I can't speak. Thank you for joining us. And definitely we'll have you, you know, on again as things evolve. Well, thank yeah. you for inviting me. Thank you yeah, for having me. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. It's been a, an absolute pleasure. It's always good to talk with you. Likewise. Yeah.